Good morning, everybody, and welcome to uh, my, my Bright Talk presentation. My name is Mike Weston. I'm the CEO of a data science consultancy in London, Dubai, called Profusion. And my the, to the topic that I'm going to talk about today is around the old Mark Twain uh, quote of lies, damn lies, and statistics. Only I'm going to be talking a little bit about lies, damn lies, and, and bad data, which is ingrained on me from growing up as being something that was very much drummed into me by my parents, this idea that you can pretty much prove anything you want to with statistics carefully. Uh, I have no idea whether that was directly involved in my career choice, uh, but it comes to me many, many times as I, as I sit and talk to organizations who we aim to help in solving some of the questions that they're, they're looking for help with from their data sets. So let's move right along and get into the presentation. Just a quick overview. There were really four um, four parts to the presentation uh, this morning. I'm going to start off by talking about when data lies. Uh, I, I figured that was quite important if we're going to justify the title of this talk. I'm going to talk a little bit about cutting through the big data hype. I'm going to then talk about what I refer to as the problem solving machine, um, which I, I think particularly in terms of my own organization's data science team, but I think is, is, is applicable to data science teams everywhere. Uh, and, and then focus a little bit on, on the future and this, this idea of prediction. So this is what we're here to talk about. Let's, uh, let's get moving. So from the lies part, I've got four quotes that I thought was worth uh, bringing in to share with us. The first is from Vin Scully, who memorably talks about the idea of statistics being used much like a drunk used as a lamppost uh, for support, not illumination. Um, often I have found uh, over the years of my career this idea that um, data and, and, and particularly market research is brought into an organization not particularly to find out what to do so much as to prove that the stakeholders decision that's already been made was the correct one. This may be a slightly cynical view but I think I can, I can point to many examples of where that's true. Uh, Mark Twain again it you know, talks about get your facts first, and you can distort them as much as you please, so effectively reinforcing that, that message. And then, of course, there's, uh, the, there's a Brit here, there's, there's Ben Goldacre, who um, has made a bit of a career out of writing about and speaking about and campaigning about the misuse of supposedly scientific proof by all kinds of organizations, notably Big Pharma, but also um, our dearly beloved political classes here in the UK um, who will quote selectively on data that supports the argument that they want you to believe. And in fact, he's just come out with a new book, um, which is, I think you'll find it's a bit more complicated than that, uh, which essentially is collecting a lot of his columns for um, various newspapers uh, over the years. And then finally, uh, I'd like to draw your attention to something. This is about a little over a year ago that this survey came out and was memorably commented on in uh, the BBC's news uh, magazine online. Uh, a survey that was conducted that suggested that up to a third of the people in the UK will lie, will, will not give truthful answers about themselves when asked by pollsters. Um, we can see all kinds of occasions when this has happened. And I think sometimes this is, you know, there's a variety of reasons that can sit behind that. Sometimes it's that people don't necessarily lie deliberately to, to others so much as are dishonest with themselves about, about what they're, uh, the way they would like to be seen rather than being able to give a true reflection of, of, of what's really in their mind. Um, and from a marketing world, I've, I've seen this picture emerge time and time again where, uh, the, the things that people tell you uh, in, in uh, gathering of declared data from in internet sites can often be completely at odds with behavior that they demonstrate. Uh, and over many years I've, I've been demonstrating that uh, declared data, in fact even past purchase data, are not necessarily the best indicators of what people are going to do next. It's, it's recent behavior that, that tends to, to provide a much clearer picture time and time again in those sorts of circumstances. So. Those are my four quotes to get us started. Let's move on to uh, another thing that started, another, another conversation 
that started me on, on my career path, which was with an old university friend of mine um, who has made her career in the world of, of market research for one of the biggest market research firms in the world, um, who said to me in an unguarded moment once that if you get an answer out of a survey that was what you weren't expecting, that was different to what you were expecting, then essentially what you've done is you've asked the wrong question. Or perhaps I should rephrase that, you've asked the question in the wrong way, because either way that you look at that phrase um, can, be, can be just as compelling, just as accurate in this case. And I think that's an enormous shame. I think the opportunity of understanding what the data are telling us is often to, to find serendipity, to find things that we weren't expecting. Uh, it can be dangerous to go too far and, and actively looking for the unexpected, but no less so than it can be dangerous in closing your mind to the unexpected and only looking for, for answers that, that fit with your predetermined view of the world. I think you need, it's, it's incredibly important, particularly in data sciences, to live up to its, its terminology as data science, uh, to, to treat it as some kind of a scientific endeavor, some kind, kind of inquiry where you, you set up hypotheses and, 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 and attempt to find proofs or disproofs as to whether or not they're true. And sometimes that means finding things that, that are counterintuitive. Uh, of course, the challenge with that is to avoid um, the, you know, the wonderful website, Know Your Fallacy, uh, to, to avoid some of the obvious fallacies, the, the idea of the Texas Sharpshooter fallacy, for example, where you take a number of shots at a barn door and then paint your target around it. Um, that can be, that can be <laughs> both attractive but also incredibly dangerous. Um, equally, the, the number of circumstances where research has been conducted from which results have come out that um, play to the questioner's prejudices. And that can happen both deliberately and, and accidentally. There's a story of a medical researcher who was having somebody compile results for them that actually inadvertently, we think, uh, just skipped samples that were inconvenient to their point of view as to what the data should, should come out with. Um, and there are so many circumstances, I go back to Ben Goldacre, there are so many circumstances where we see this to be true. The idea in, in medical research where you keep researching until you, you find an answer that you want makes you treat headlines in the newspapers and on TV, if you're alert to this, with considerable suspicion. Um, topically, this morning, there was a headline in um, my newspaper this morning that was telling me that women who drink diet soda drinks like Diet Coke and, and what have you are more likely to lose weight than women who drink water. And this is based, and then the, and the, the, the explanation that's provided for this is that the, um, the diet soda drink will satisfy their craving for something sweet and so they'll have less desserts. Uh, how I, I, I look at that and my instinct is to think, hmm, I wonder how many times they tested that before they came out with that particular result and I wonder who paid for the survey. Uh, I'm not suggesting anything directly happened with that particular survey, but that level of, um, of caution when reading, particularly in the, in the news media, results from surveys, I, I think is something that I, I would encourage when I speak to, to, to have. So let's think about how surveys can get it wrong. Um, I'm not saying surveys are without value or that they always get it wrong, but they frequently do. And there are an, an, any number of well-recorded incidents of this. Um, it was very topical this year in the UK as we looked at uh, what was going to happen and, and what did happen in our general election. And you know, I ask you just to kind of cast your mind back a little bit if, if you're listening in from the UK. Uh, and, and think about uh, what happened in the 2015 election campaign. Of all of the polls that were published, the general view was that the um, Conservative Party, who were sharing government in a coalition with the, with the Liberal Democrats, could not win an overall majority. In fact, they were likely to slip backwards. The balance was that it would probably be a hung parliament again, that we would need another coalition, 
and that it was more likely to be um, Ed Miliband's Labour Party that would lead that coalition than the Conservatives. And, the, and that was true on the exit polls from the election as well. You know, we, saw, we, we, we saw nobody who really managed to predict that David Cameron and the Conservatives would end up with the first Conservative majority for a generation. Uh, so, so how did it go so wrong? Um, there are a, a number of things that, that, that potentially could lie behind that. Uh, and there's been an awful lot, of course, of analysis around that. And this isn't the first time that this has happened in a British election in, in, in my 30 years of living in this country. Uh, in 1992, the same sort of thing happened. Um, there'd been a Conservative government for many, many years, and everyone expected the Labour Party to win, to the extent that the leader of the Labour Party, just before the election, addressing a rally of his supporters, turned around and said to them, go back to your constituencies and prepare for government. And they lost, and they lost horribly. The Conservatives won. Um, the outcome was a seven-point Tory win. And at the time, it was there were all sorts of uh, explanations as to why the survey, had, the survey community had got it so wrong. There was, a, there was even a commission that was appointed to look into it. Um, there were three reasons for it, which if you can read the text on the screen, you'll, you'll understand. But essentially, it's late swing, which has happened in some US elections as well. Um, so voters change their mind after having been interviewed for the, for, for the survey. The second is um, that samples may have been skewed, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Uh, and, and thirdly, um, there was this idea of, of the shy Tories. Uh, people were going to vote Conservative, but didn't necessarily want to tell the pollster that that was what was in their mind. So people were, were, were preparing to, to vote for a party that they were embarrassed to tell people that they were going to vote. Oh, Barris may be too strong, but, but shy of telling people what was happening. Um, part of the deconstruction post-2015 election was that we added a new group to this, which is Lazy Labour. And it's often been noted that, that Labour Party supporters are less likely to cast their vote than Conservative Party supporters or, or Lib Dem supporters. So this idea that, that whilst a lot of people said that they were going to... Um, they were going to vote Labour. They maybe didn't make it to the to the polling booth in time. I found myself, in fact, last week in Dublin at the Web Summit. Uh, slightly odd situation, sitting in a room in, in Dublin, listening to a bunch of British people talking about British politics. But this this subject was very much there, and and they were taking it from a slightly different point of view as well. They were looking at the uh, the emphasis on social media comment as a predictor of, um, of what was going to happen in, in election results. And the, the, perhaps the, the, the key memorable quote that came out of that is that Twitter is not Britain. <laughs> the, the, the people who engage on, on, in commentary on social media, uh, you can't take as being a representative sample of the population at large. So. This has happened in the United States as well. This is, um, I, I think, a really, a really fascinating one. I remember this from my history lessons um, growing up back in New Zealand many, many years ago, uh, where we talked about the 1936 poll that was conducted by the Literary Digest. At the time, there were 40 million Americans registered to vote. And the Literary Digest decided that they would repeat what they'd done in the past and that they would, um, they would poll a, a, a broad constituency of that 40 million to try and predict, and they thought they could predict within 1%, the outcome of the actual presidential election. And they went to press with their prediction and published it, um, only to have to retract it. Uh, shortly after the election with this, this, this wonderful front cover. I only found a black and white image of that. I don't know whether that was actually printed in black or whether it was in fact printed in their more accustomed red, um, but they, they clearly made an error. There we go. I've given the game away, but you kind of expected that because I don't think anyone can remember having heard about a President Landon. But their expectation was that Landon would win a landslide. And they based this on a sample of 10 million Americans, that's one in four voters, 
they'd acquired that list through every US telephone directory. They'd taken it from mag magazine subscription lists and from club rosters. The problem with that is that despite what's almost a big data scale um, sample size of, of, of one in four voters, they got it so badly wrong. Uh, the selection bias that came out of this, I think, was massive. If you look at this, their 10 million out of 40 million didn't include, or is highly unlikely to have included, the 9 million unemployed people who, despite not being um, listed in the telephone directory because they likely couldn't afford a telephone at the time, you know, bear in mind, 1936 telephone adoption was nothing like it is today. And secondly, that they probably weren't paying money to subscribe to magazines or, or, or club rosters. Um, the result is that they were unrepresented within this sample. So you have a massive sample bias right there. And then, of course, there's another piece to this. There's a non-response bias in there. Because of the 10 million cards that were sent out to gather votes, um, or to gather predictions for the vote, only 2.4 million came back. Now, anyone who works in direct marketing would think, oh, wow, they've sent a mail out of 10 million, I've got 2.4 million back. That's a pretty good response. Yeah, from a, from a marketing perspective, that would be an exceptionally good result. But in terms of trying to calculate public opinion and to predict an election result, not so good. So big data 1936 style, let's look at the numbers. How did that actually work out? Their prediction was that Landon wouldn't just win, he'd walk it with 57% of the vote, leaving this, this other chap, Roosevelt, uh, who, who I'm sure has been consigned to, to the, the dustbin of history because he missed out on the election victory, right? Leaving him with a mere 43%. The actual result was not just reversed, it was, it was fundamentally different. Instead of uh, a 14-point margin in favor of Landon, Roosevelt absolutely came to the election, 62% of the vote versus 38. Um, that's a pretty spectacular fail on a survey. And I think we've, we've, we've gone quite a long way to explain why. But sample failure, sample bias, is not the only major type of bias we need to think about with surveys. Let's go back to that, um, that, that quote I, I had a little earlier on, that if you get an answer you weren't expecting, you've asked the question wrong. Here's a fantastic example of where the question was asked in a way that may have had a little bit of influence on the outcome. A true American's favorite colors are red, white, and blue. Are these your favorite colors? Naturally, this was a questionnaire that went out to an American audience. Now look at the answers that you had to choose from. Yes, absolutely. Of course, I'm not a true American. I'll say no more. I will say one thing, which is that whilst that's an extreme and slightly comedic example of, of question bias, the way in which you phrase the question will have a direct impact on the answer that you might expect. And asking the same thing in different ways um, can produce wildly different results. Um, actually, just, just on that thought, Going back to that 1985 election in the UK that I was talking about earlier on, uh, I remember watching the first televised poll that took place before the election and thinking it was, it was not, from my point of view, I didn't feel it was particularly conclusive one way or another. But I was hugely amused by the, uh, the opinion polls that were published in the wake of that, where ITV, who screened the debate, showed that it was too close to call and you couldn't really pick an overall winner and wow, wasn't that exciting. And by the way, we've got another one coming up. The Guardian, which is traditionally a, a more, um, more uh, comparatively left-wing leaning newspaper from an editorial stance, felt that, that, uh, that Ed Miliband had acquitted himself very well and, and as for um, Nicola Sturgeon up in Scotland, wow, wasn't she amazing? The Scotsman unsurprisingly thought that, that Nicola had absolutely walked away with the, with the spoils from the debate. Um, and the Times, uh, which is more of an establishment, more of a conservative-leading newspaper, particularly at the moment, 
were, were complimentary of, of just what a great job uh, David Cameron did. And the view was going into that, that poll that this was hugely important because five years ago, um, Nick Clegg, as leader of the Liberal Democrats, had absolutely outperformed during a similar debate and ended up as Deputy Prime Minister as a result, having been in charge of a party that everybody thought was little more than a, than a protest vote prior to that, um, which changed the face of British politics quite significantly. Anyway, to the content on the slide, let's get back to this. I'm going to stop talking about lies for a bit now, and I'm going to start talking about hyperbole. And even while I was at the Web Summit, I saw this happen three or four times. There's been an, an absolutely extraordinary increase in the number of presentations that I have sat through over the last five years that have started talking about just how much more data there is in the world. And just playing around with that a, a, a little bit, you know, the idea that we've gone from a, from a position where nobody used to talk about how much data there was in the world back in 1995 to the point now where it's difficult to walk into a lecture theatre with, with anything relating to analytics and data, uh, data studies, data science, um, coming away without actually having had that presented. I think it's, it's getting quite difficult. We're living in a world where we know that information overload exists. We know that navigating your way through um, the myriad forms of data that are available to us is, is there. Um, I'm just going to touch on that quickly because clearly my presentation wouldn't be complete if I didn't. So let's think about how that data breaks down. Um, what sort of data can we gather? What sort of data should we be looking at? Um, as I was getting ready for this talk this morning, um, I, I discovered something which was too late to put into this presentation, uh, but which amused me quite enormously, which was a, a comment about how uh, one of the, um, the politicians in New York City wants to give trees, about 200 trees in Central Park, an email address, which is, <laughs> which sounds entirely comical, except that has already been done in Melbourne um, a couple of years ago. And people are not just emailing in to, to say, oh, look, tree, there's, there's, there's something wrong. There's a bit of, uh, bit of dead wood there. That branch is looking like it's been damaged or, or, or what have you. People are emailing into the trees and, and telling them about their love affairs and their exam pressures and, 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 and all of these kinds of things. And I imagine we might start seeing the same sort of thing happening in New York if this politician gets his way. But it, uh, it, it amuses me on the idea that, that one of the things that seems to be increasing the amount of, of data that's available in the world is the, uh, is the rise of the Internet of Things, IoT, which I might, might now start referring to as the Internet of Trees. Uh, but data sources are becoming incredibly more uh, accessible and more varied. Um, I've just picked a few here. Our background as an organization, we came from um, the marketing world, and particularly the CRM world. And, and so uh, the, the, the question around what sort of data we use is, is here is, is somewhat from a marketing e-commerce point of view. I'll talk a little bit more about other forms of data in a moment. Um, but if you look now to think what actually you might, what types of data you might consider including to inform your, your marketing programs, obviously We've always been talking about research and, 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 and uh, excuse me, and demographic data, which can be bought on, on aggregate level. And we've spent most of the last sort of 50, 60 years in marketing. Um, since Lord Lever talked about half my advertising budget being wasted, I just don't know which half. Trying to refine that through the use of demographics. And demographics still underpin an awful lot of the way in which media is, is bought and sold, particularly in, in, in the offline world, but to some extent in the online world as well. And I've always tended to think about demographics as being a, a proxy for actually knowing who your, your customer is. Um, so if I'm selling a, a Ford Focus, do I care whether it's a, a, a 15 to 34-year-old um, uh, woman in the southeast of Britain uh, versus uh, a 73-year-old man in the world? Not, not really. I just want to make sure that someone's going to buy that car and, and, and buy it new from me and, and, and maintain it and, and go through. We, we use these as ways to try and predict what, uh, 
which, which people are most likely to be there. And it's a, it's a flawed and imperfect way of looking at the world, and there are better ways of doing it. So let's have a look at this a little bit more. So we're gathering data. In, in this case, I'm, I'm combining a group of data that come from declared sources, from um, observed sources, such as web analytics or, or for responses to, to direct marketing campaigns, um, and past purchase the transactional data that goes there. I'd also want to include in that things like um, what's happening where I am. There's all sorts of ways of getting location data, and there's all sorts of things that we can do with that location data using things such as weather forecasts and, and, and events that might be happening in that area to, to influencing the, the, the marketing programs that we're putting together. So we've got that data. What do we do with it? Welcome to <laughs> the ascent of, of, of data science. And in case you're wondering, um, that's not me on the end there. I'm not, I'm not clever enough to be a data scientist myself. Uh, that's uh, a, a chap called Henrik Nordmark, who's the head of data science at, at, at my organization, Profusion. Um, but we were just having a little playful moment when we saw this photograph of Henrik that it would work quite well in this context. Um, data science, for me, and, and, and I'm, I'm taking this actually largely from, from the way Henrik talks about the discipline, is bringing together two strands of, of the academic world that separated a little while back. Um, so from, from mathematics through into statistics um, on the one string, combined with um, computer science going into areas of artificial intelligence uh, and machine learning and, and such on the other side and, and bringing those two together. And I've heard as a, as a definition of a data scientist this idea that it's, 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 a, it's a statistician who is better at programming than any other statistician and a programmer who's better at statistics than any other programmer that you, you might gather. It's bringing those two fields together, which is essentially where, where this discipline has, has come from. Um, and I'm conscious that there's an enormous amount of hype that exists around this terminology. Um, in fact, I, I, I was due to be having a debate with um, with a, a gentleman from Information Age um, about whether or not data science was a, was a real thing. Uh, I, I believe we can prove conclusively that it is based on the work that we do for, for, for our clients and the work that I've seen other data scientists do both inside and organizations and, and outside of them. Uh, but essentially, what I think data science is, and, and the way that we tend to think about it, is as a problem-solving machine. So what kind of problems can it solve? How do, how, do we, how do we put that into action? I think, in the, in the spirit of, of some kind of scientific rigor, we need to start from the idea that you have to understand what is the question. We have to understand what is the business question or the, or the organizational question or the, or the, the theoretical uh, proposition that we're trying to clarify. So I think, like in um, systems design or, or any kind of programming, Getting, doing the requirements gathering correctly at the beginning is the piece that will go further to determining the likely success or failure of a data science project than almost anything else. So having a clearly stated, measurable question is your starting point. From there, there's a bit of clarification around the questions you want answered. We need to be investigating the data points, what, 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 what needs to be included within the study. Um, <laughs> And I'm inclined to think that in the early stages you start with as, as many data sources as you, as, you, as you reasonably can. You tend to include things rather than exclude things and then look to see how the data pans out before you start excluding things. I think if you exclude things too early, you risk um, missing something that could be hugely influential. Um, you will need to, to clarify and, and, and refine as you go through because obviously too much uh, too much noise can 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 mask the the signal, uh, but at the same time that that's that's where we're going for. We start to identify the issues, start to to propose solutions and and, and agree approach, and then it's in, it's about interrogating the it, it's halfway around this 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 model. It's around interrogating the data and building models. We we start that at that point. That happens quite late in the process. Uh, for me, I think it's also about. It's incredibly important not just to to find theoretical answers to questions. I think it's I, I firmly believe, in contrast to, to Kenneth Cook here in his book about big data, I still 
think is incredibly important that we try to figure out whether the patterns that we're finding in the data as we're exploring them are simply coincidence or, or whether they represent causality because the thing that you do next will rest on the answer to that question. So there's any number of places you can go to on the internet to find random correlations between disparate data sets that make no sense. Murder rate in a particular part of the United States being linked to the number of swimming pools probably doesn't have much causality involved in it. Or if it does, I've not, I've not been able to identify that link. Um, on the other hand, um, potentially the number of, of child drownings may relate to the number of secure covers that those swimming pools have uh, during the winter months, for example. Uh, so it's, it's trying to work out whether the connection between the question or the answers that, that, that appear to the question that you're asking and what the data are telling you need to understand whether it's cause and effect or, or, or whether it's merely coincidence. Because drawing from that reporting of, of, of saying what's happening, we need to be able to deliver insight. We need to find out why it's happening. And only then, I think, can we start using that to form a strategy for, for insight-based execution, which then provides us with that, that, that final piece of the circle, if you like, which is the, which is the action part, <clears throat> which then produces more data for us to, to, to analyze and, and continuously improve. And I think that this process applies um, pretty much across um, whichever type of um, whichever type of work that you're, you're undertaking. So, conscious that we're probably two thirds of the way through our time here, so I'm gonna pick up the pace a little bit here. Um, what kind of problems can data science solve? As I say, we come from a marketing and, and e-commerce background, but equally we're finding ourselves answering some really interesting questions about customer segmentation. We are talking, particularly with the use of, um, of wearable devices, we've, we've done quite some, some interesting research around things like employee well-being. We're seeing data science being applied in various smart city initiatives around the world, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a moment. Um, of course, it applies to things like supply chain and, and, and logistics, and even predictive maintenance, the idea of being able to carry out um, maintenance on, say, for example, a mobile phone company's cellular network to fix problems before they've happened, uh, I think is a, is a really interesting area for, for data science. That list could go on and on and on. But those are the major areas that we've been interested in. And I'm just going to focus a little bit on a couple of those. I'm going to talk about customer segmentation. Time and again, when talking to marketing organizations, um, we talk about how they segment their customers. And, and, and often you'll find people who are incredibly proud of, of having divided their audience into as many as a dozen um, different persona. And these can be based typically on things like market research and will be drawn up by often traditional advertising agencies. And, and I think of it as being the, the Russell Grant approach to, to customer segmentation. It's there are 12 types of people in the world. They are roughly equal in size. Their membership of a particular group is fixed and constant by something which is beyond their control and doesn't take into account their actual behavior. But they're loose enough to be recognizable to anyone who fits in with, with those groups for them to go, oh, yeah, that really catches me. Does that ring any bells with anybody? I, I apologize to any any uh, excited readers of um, of horoscopes in the daily paper uh, who, who who may be offended by this, but I think this is this is quite true to what I see in a lot of marketing organisations, particularly in large companies. What I'd like to see is doing in terms of customer segmentation 2015 style is a much more dynamic approach to it because people change; they're not the same. Uh, at, uh, uh, to, they won't be the same tomorrow as they were yesterday. Their interests will change. Um, knowing, for example, who was likely to be buying car insurance three months ago is a completely useless piece of information today because that, that will have happened. And the concept of buying car insurance is probably not on that person's mind again for another 11 months and 29 days, right? So. 
the answer to the question that you ask of your segmentation model should be able to be changed depending on the question that's being asked and the time that it's being asked. So you want segments that aren't defined by preconceived ideas, by socio-demographics and, and, and those kinds of things primarily. It will take those into account, but it will be defined more by customers' actual characteristics and motivations taking advantage of that idea that it's behavior that, that, that drives that. We can build much, much, much more personalized and sophisticated segmentation models based on that. Um, I remember in the early days of, of internet marketing, we all got terribly excited about the concept of, of getting to one-to-one to, to -one -to -one marketing. And uh, there was a bit of a backlash about that way back in the 1990s when people started talking about the idea that one-to-one -one marketing was going to be impossible because actually to have that, that level of individualization was simply unmanageable for, for any individual working in the marketing department. And over the last few years, we've seen the rise of this, this thing called programmatic, which is the idea that actually you don't ask individuals to do it. Um, you, you, you get computer, computing power, processing power to, to do it for you. And we are genuinely getting much closer to um, an ultra-personalized world. We would still want to group those together for, for convenience, for, for, for maintaining the, uh, the achievability of sophisticated marketing plans. Going to move on to smart cities. Um, and again, this is an area which is potentially prone to a little bit of hype. Um, there are any number of places around the world who for one reason or another have decided that they want to either build from scratch a smart city or take something which is already there and, and convert it into something which is smart. Um, I saw a chap speak last week from Philips about um, smart street lighting, uh, talking about how in uh, the example he used was Los Angeles and how in, in LA the, uh, the network of street lights were being replaced with um, LED lighting with sensors attached to them, which meant the need for um, having plugging into the telecommunications network to, to transfer data. But again, an enormous amount of data suddenly becoming available that allows for not just the, the massive decline in, uh, in cost of running the lighting because LEDs are so much cheaper to, to run, and also to maintain, but also ensuring that when a street light goes out, that the sensor is going to phone home and tell the engineer to come out and replace it, which reduces the number of black spots and increases safety in the city, that can look dynamically to see how busy a particular area is and brighten or, or lower the luminosity of the lights to, to, to further manage the electrical consumption. And when an accident takes place in, in an area at night, it can brighten the lights around that particular area to allow the emergency services uh, a, a more effective cleanup um, program. So that, that's just one small part of it. The, the smart city piece for me is, um, is, is much broader than that. And if we look at um, Manchester in the UK, there's the Data GM project, which is taking data from all kinds of sources and pulling it together trying to use that to build uh, a city structure which is better for the people who live in there and, and provide opportunities for much smarter uh, pretty much everything from, from laying on a public transport and, and, and other services through to um, the old thing that, that has been talked about for many years about when somebody digs a hole in the ground to repair the, the water main should we be able to repair the gas and the electricity through the same hole and having better planning around those kinds of things. Not to mention the, um, the, the, the ability to use uh, fast data connections as they are in Bristol um, to, to link the world of, um, of academe uh, at Bristol University with the, the world of, of, of commerce with the various organizations who have um, their, their major um, campuses, uh, their, their head offices down in that part of the world to, to, to allow uh, academic thought and, and industrial thought to, to come together. And of course, I'm, I mentioned at the start, we're, we're in, um, as a business, we're in Dubai as well. Uh, and a couple of years ago, Sheikh Mohammed announced um, a smart city project to transform Dubai. And Dubai is an amazing place. It's one of those, um, one of those places that, that exists almost through the sheer force of will 
and the application of, of money, which presents a wonderful opportunity to build something which is truly connected and, and truly smart. Uh, so I think some really interesting stuff to be done there. I don't know what the answers to those are, but I know where we're going to look. We're going to look by connecting the data sources that are available to us to, to work with in those smart cities uh, and explore what patterns we can see and what we can do to improve people's life in there. So, how do we begin? Start with the data. Um, there's a story last week about the amount of data that organizations hold that they aren't using, that they're not exploring, that they're not understanding, and the cost that that's beginning to incur on those organizations just to hold that data. So you have two choices, right? You either throw the data away or you start shining a light on, on that dark data. Um, I think you probably do the second and, and figure out whether there's anything there to have. And, and, and then go back to the first. Um, data architecture is incredibly important. Simply having the data, particularly in, 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 in siloed forms, as is so often the case, um, isn't going to help you get any answers unless you've got the correct architecture in place to help you pull that through. And the, the changes in what's possible over the last few years has, has made that a much more interesting, but also more complicated thing to do. Um, most importantly, though, is I do think that whatever we do in the world of, of, of data science, if we haven't got into a position where we have a strategy and the ability to take action on the part of it, um, then essentially it's just been so much of a um, of a uh, of a self-focused and not particularly productive activity. Let's put it that way. So, my belief. Um, we're going to see a continued explosion in the amount of data that's available. Uh, we're going to move to a world where we don't talk to people as, as blunt, amorphous masses of like-minded sheep, but we speak to people individually as people, which I think can, can help to make um, communication between organizations and people much more productive for both sides. I think data science and the principles behind it will be in the core of almost every business decision and will impact almost every business. Um, beyond that, I'm not sure, particularly in the light of what we've seen about failed predictions, that I want to predict much further. Um, there's an old Danish proverb, which is sometimes uh, attributed to Niels Bohr, uh, that prediction, predictions are a hazardous business, especially when they involve the future. And that's all I have for you on the presentation.